The God Thing. This is episode 45. You're listening to 70 Trek with Bob Turner and Kelly Casco. The fan podcast that looks at Star Trek in the 1970s. It was the decade that built a franchise. It was the first attempt to bring a live action version of Star Trek back. And it was utterly rejected. I'm Bob Turner. And I'm Kelly Castor. Yeah, Gene Roddenberry's 1975 script might have been turned down by Paramount, but it definitely was a fascinating look in, into what could have been for the franchise. And we're going to talk about it on this episode. But first, let me remind everyone how to find us. You can reach us at our Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash 70s Trek. You can also send us an email to 70s Trek at gmail.com. And you can find the show on iTunes. Just search 70s Trek in the podcast section. And please consider leaving us a rating or a review, because when you do, it helps other people find the show. In 1975, Paramount was taking notice of Star Trek. The property was doing really well in syndication, and it was earning the studio a lot of money. A lot of money. Money, money, money. Millions. So they decided to offer Gene Roddenberry a, a development deal to bring Star Trek to the big screen. The movie had a budget of $5 million dollars. And production was scheduled to start on July 15th, 1976. Now, if you remember, we first touched on Gene returning to Paramount back in episode 27 of 70s Trek. Now, Gene had to deliver. You know, he was under a lot of pressure, not only to bring this property back to life, but to show everybody in Hollywood that he was more than just a one-trick pony. Yeah, after Star Trek ended, uh, nothing went well for Gene professionally. Nope. So we needed this project to go well. Uh, so we went back to a theme that Star Trek had explored at least seven times in its three-year run. He asked the question, what is God? So the name of this script that we're going to talk about today is The God Think. But before we go too far, we should probably say that this was not Gene's first idea. Um, his first idea was to write a prequel, a story that would explain how Kirk, Spock, McCoy, and everyone else first came together. A prequel 30 yeah. years before J.J. Abrams did it. Wow. Yeah, I thought that was, um, was kind of noteworthy. But, you know, they couldn't come up with a reasonable story. And, of course, there would have to be actors playing those characters that weren't William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, DeForest Kelly. And right. that didn't sit well with the actors either. So that idea was <laughs> abandoned. Goodbye. Here's another interesting thing that was going on at the time. Paul McCartney had asked Gene to work on a project for him. Really? Yeah. Uh, Sir Paul, get this, kids, was an avid Star Trek fan. I didn't know this. I love that. I, I, I need to go listen to the album Band on the Run after we're done here. So Paul had envisioned a cosmic story that involved a war of the bands out in space somewhere. And who better to write a script like that than the great bird of the galaxy himself, Gene Roddenberry. So just as they started talking about this, and, and Paul invited Gene and his assistant, Susan Sackett, to go to a concert, and then they met afterwards, just as all this starts to percolate and starts to get going, Paramount called. And Gene <laughs> never had the chance to work on McCartney's project. Dang. I know. So go figure. That would have been really interesting. I don't know how it would have turned out, but it would have been really interesting. So here we go. So Roddenberry sits down after throwing out the idea of the prequel and comes up with the God think. So what we want to do now is sort of walk you through 
how the how the script plays out. There isn't a hard copy of the script to be found anywhere online in a, in a complete form. There are 18 pages available on one site, and you can kind of look through that and see what's happening. But in terms of the entire 156-page script, it was printed in book form in some books that are out of print. So we had to do a lot of research to put together this plot. So let's, uh, let's start with it. And you're going to find some similarities between this script and other movies that you've seen. The story starts on Vulcan, with Spock studying how to be less human and be more logical. His thoughts are interrupted by something out in space. He feels that this something is about to happen to his human friends, Kirk and McCoy and everyone else. One of the masters that he's studying with tells him, hey, you haven't really been successful casting out your human half, have you? And he encourages Spock, you know what? It's okay. Reach out with your mind. Let's see what's happening on Earth. Then the scene shifts to a dry dock in Earth orbit where the Enterprise is being refitted. And then to the planet's surface where people are beginning to receive mental impressions that God is returning. And while this is happening... Starfleet picks up a huge ship approaching Earth. It's a thousand times larger than any starship. And as it approaches, and they they send out the USS Potemkin, and this thing just wipes the Potemkin away with no problems. That's Act 1. Act 2, Kirk, of course, is going to assemble his old crew. And they uh, take the refitted Enterprise to face this new threat. Uh, one of the Vulcans on board co- makes this comment, and this is important for later. I think we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, the comment is, if this is your God, he's not very impressive. He's got so many psychological problems. He's so insecure. He demands worship every seven days. Jeez. He goes out and creates faulty humans and then blames them for uh, his own mistakes. He's a pretty poor excuse for a supreme being. <laughs> Okay. Again, that was in the script. That wasn't Kelly and I. <laughs> <laughs> no, that word for word. I had to read that that um, line several times when I read the, the eight, first 18 pages. It stings. Uh, yes. The Enterprise finally arrives at the ship, and the alien manifests itself on board the Enterprise as a human probe. It kind of sounds familiar. Hmm. hmm. And it asks Kirk. Do you know me? Of course, Kirk goes, no, I don't know who you are. And it responds, strange. How could you not know who I am? And it changes form to look like Jesus Christ. And again asks, do you know me? Of course, Kirk responds, yes. Now I know who you are. The ship turns out to be a computer that is a living entity uh, pretending to be a god. And wow. it actually probably thinks it's a god. So the computer ship explains that it interacts with planets, um, ascertains their level of society, and provides a profit that's suitable uh, for that level of development. Then it interacts and helps that society advance. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it, send, it is sent to give the law, and I did air quotes there. There you go. Um, <laughs> And then returns later and gives the law again in a new way uh, for, you know, for the more advanced society to comprehend. Now, it says it it visited Earth many times in the past. And when it arrives this time, it's broken. And instead of providing a new prophet, it shows us Christ again. So, yeah, it's got a chip loose or something. Yeah. But upon in- investigation, Kirk and the crew discover that this god, um, again, air quotes, the god humans have been worshiping, is actually the deceiver, the devil or Lucifer, if you will. It, <laughs> wow. it is the computer programmed remains of a race who were cast out from their dimension and um, thrown into this one. Now, you must... You must help me, the pro demands. And Kirk, well, guess what he's going to do? He's going to refuse. 
So the computer ship, God, devil thing, <laughs> puts Kirk and the crew through some trials. And one includes Kirk engaged in nude <laughs> oil wrestling with three women. This is, this is confirmed in Susan Sackett's book, Inside Trek. The following is supposedly an excerpt from the script. Quote, they were nude, of course, except for their pair of game sandals, and young women that way had a disconcerting way of looking quite different. It disconcerted Kirk that the thought made his own genitals tighten against the metallic mesh which protected male vulnerability during the game. <laughs> Unquote. Awesome. Uh, and I didn't giggle. I... I uh, I am pretty sophomoric at times, and I didn't giggle during that. So in the end... I did. <laughs> thank you. You did it for both of, <laughs> both of us. In the end, Kirk and the crew went out over the computer. The ship, god, computer, devil thing returns to its own dimension, and the Enterprise crew, well, interestingly, they're left with a gift. So they return to Earth and discover they've been given the gift of time. Now, the entity made them younger, and they are now returning from their first five-year mission. Wow. So before we go on, let's talk about this a little bit off the cuff here, Kel. Um, I have to say I'm cool with all of this, mainly because I've seen it before in the motion picture. I'm good with all the way up to the point where the Enterprise encounters this thing. It's fascinating to me that I think Roddenberry is trying to say, hey— God that we all grew up learning about, and Jesus, too, they're really aliens who came to us early on, and early man just sort of looked at them and said, wow, you're so much more advanced, and we're going to worship you like, like you're a God. <sighs> well, and guide you through your evolution, basically. Right, right. Um, again, it's Roddenberry looking at God, questioning what is God. Don't get me wrong. I've been cutting the grass at times, and in my own mind, I thought, huh, wouldn't that be an interesting idea? What if? But it, it's a different thing to put it down on paper and really challenge the um, Judeo-Christian, even uh, Islamic God concept. Right. Right. I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't have been happy. No, probably not. And and yet there's part of me, there's part of me that would have liked to have seen this movie. I'll be honest with you. There's something about it that I'm interested in. Well, and we kind of do in a couple different movies. We kind of do in a couple of different movies. Sure. Why don't you tell us more about yep. what happened afterwards? Sure. So Gene finished the script on June 30th, 1975. Now, it, ha it was time to submit it to the studio. Paramount was led by Barry Diller at the time, and he was a devout Catholic, and there's no way <laughs> that the God thing was going to get approved. No. No. So, of course, he rejected it in August, and he told Gene um, that the Star Trek development deal was basically off, uh, but he could keep his office and do some stuff. Uh Diller began soliciting others for Star Trek movie ideas. I, I think that's funny. Like, you're done. You can stick around if you want. Who else has got some ideas? I need some <laughs> Star Trek ideas now. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Next. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Susan Sackett, uh, she comments that Gene had been asking, what if the God of the Old Testament, full of tirades and demands to be worshipped, actually turned out to be Lucifer? So if so, was the serpent's offer of the fruit of knowledge actually a gift from the real God? Interesting. Mm. Captain Kirk versus God. This was not the story Paramount, no. though, had, had expected. No. So the movie was obviously postponed from fall 1975 until uh, the following spring so that a new script could be found. I wonder here from, from that quote from Susan Sackett, was she trying to say that Gene was trying to say that because the serpent was offering knowledge, 
that the serpent was actually God. Right. And that because... Never mind. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> we got it all wrong. I, I, never mind. So <laughs> when it comes to the God thing, here's what Gene Roddenberry had to say about it. Quote, actually... It wasn't God they were meeting, he said, but someone who had been born here on Earth before, claiming to be God. I was going to say that this false thing, claiming to be God, had screwed up man's concept of the real infinity and beauty of what God is. Paramount was reluctant to put that up on the screen, and I can understand their position. And Here's another quote. It was too controversial. It talked about concepts like, who is God? The Enterprise meets God in space. God is a life form. And I wanted to suggest that there may have been at one time in the human beginning an alien entity that early man believed was God and kept those legends. But I also wanted to suggest that it might have been as much the devil as it was God. After all, what kind of God would throw humans out of paradise for eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge? Unquote. And here's one more from Gene. Quote, it was felt by some higher-ups that my script might offend religious people. Perhaps it had just offended them. I had had the script read by a couple of Jesuit priest friends, a rabbi, and a number of others, and they were not offended. Unquote. Wow. Incredible. So I was struck by how many similarities there were between the God thing and the motion picture. Yeah. So um, help me out as I go along if sure. I miss anything, Bob. So the story starts on Vulcan. Spock studying how to be less human. His thoughts are interrupted by something out in space. Hmm. I think we've <laughs> seen that before. Yes. The Enterprises and Dry Dock above the earth being refitted. I think that was used. Yes. Kirk is an admiral. Yep. There is a large ship approaching earth. Yeah. <laughs> There's a transporter accident. Huh? Yeah. Just a, just a side note in the script. It was gruesome. Yuck. Yeah. Uh, Kirk puts his crew back together and takes over the enterprise to face the threat. Um, and, McCoy had left Starfleet. Yep. The ship turns out to be a living computer, kind of like Feeger. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. The threat knocks out the USS Potemkin, just as Viger did. Uh, With the and, three Klingon ships. Right, exactly. Oh, and there was uh, a probe sent to the Enterprise that looked like a person. A person, right. And I think, yeah, that that's interesting. So here are some similarities to Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. The God thing as the crew going has the crew going on a journey to meet God. <laughs> yeah. Kind of the same thing happened. Uh, in The God Thing, the entity shows the crew many faces, asking if they recognize him until they finally face – there's a face that Kirk knows, which is Jesus. Wow. Yeah. Um, so the same – and again, the same thing happened in Star Trek V. Uh, the alien prisoner shows our guys all of those faces until he settles on what is traditionally the image of God with a white beard. Right. Um, also in the God thing, the entity turns out to be the devil, a deceiver, just like the alien in Star Trek V. Jeez. Yep. Yep. So, so what's – Noteworthy here is that Gene hated Star Trek V. I know. <laughs> he didn't want it to be canon. I know. Uh, so as it was as it was being produced, he denounced it eh, quite frequently. Yeah. Uh, John Povel wrote, the fact that the God thing never got produced could have been the reason Gene hated the idea of Star Trek V. So there was a point when Shatner was working on the script for Star Trek V, and he gave the script to Gene Roddenberry to read. And when Roddenberry read it, he was really miffed. And he gave the pages to his assistant, Susan Sackett, and she read them. And she threw the script down, and she said, Gene, Bill stole your idea. <laughs> 
no. That's funny. Oh, my gosh. So maybe that's why he was mad. Maybe. <laughs> so after the God thing is shelved and rejected, it's not really sh- shelved, Roddenberry thinks to himself, huh, maybe this would make a good novel written by me, Gene Roddenberry. And so he starts talking to Bantam <laughs> Books and says, hey, I've got this idea and it would be great. You want to publish it? And they agree. So there was a short article in Starlog, number three, January 1977, about the novel. Um, Here's what it had to say. Roddenberry is presently adapting his first script written for the Star Trek film, which was rejected, into a novel. Uh, Here's a quote from Gene. Quote, generally, the situation is that the five-year mission is over and that it has been for some time. Most of the regular crew have been promoted and, for the most part, are pretty unhappy with shuffling papers and other administrative jobs. Scotty's become an alcoholic, and McCoy... (laughs) I know. And McCoy has given up treating human patients to become a veterinarian, (laughs) loudly proclaiming animals as the only sensible patients... He has ever had. If I were Kirk, uh, Spock, anybody, I'd be kind of PO'd about that. But I could see McCoy doing that. I suppose. It gives us a kind of a fun look, Gene goes on to say, at these people's strengths and weaknesses. In the story, there is a story that brings them all together again. Unquote. So what happens next? Well, Gene kind of writes this thing up, but it's really thin. It's really thin. And he gets John Polville involved to help with the book a little bit. And during this time, Planet of Titans was announced, and Phase 2 is around the corner. And so Roddenberry is really busy, and he can't put any more time towards working on the book. So he gets Walter Koenig involved. Yes. Mr. Chekhov takes a stab at expanding this thin manuscript that Gene had written. In March 78, 14 months later, Starlog again reports that the novel was about half done. In September 1978, Susan Sackett wrote in Starlog, quote, Bantam Books has given him an extension in completing this because of the production of the film, which is a full-time effort, unquote. That's totally reasonable. Yeah. I can see that. With all of the production going on around the motion picture at that point, I get that. In 1979, the motion picture premieres, followed by Star Trek II, III, IV, V, <laughs> Star Trek The Next Generation, Star Trek VI, and the God Thing book is completely forgotten. There was a book? <laughs> yeah, right. Just before Gene's death in 1991... Susan Sackett discovered the manuscript and contacted Pocket Books. Um, Pocket Books had the, the rights to Star Trek books at that time, and, and they wanted to publish it. Uh, initially, Sackett and Fred Bronson started work expanding the novel. Then Gene dies. Susan leaves um, Paramount, and Pocket Books decides to have Michael Jan Friedman uh, work on it. Then in 1994, Gene's biographer, David Alexander, also worked on the book. (laughs) There's a lot of people that worked on this thing. Now, the publisher, though, at that time, went as far as designing a dust jacket for the book. So you'll see that online. You can find it at Wikipedia. You can even find it. There is an Amazon listing for the God thing that shows the dust jacket. Yep. But it was never to be. And B meaning never published. So after looking at the God thing, I've got one question I do want to ask. And that is this. That is this. This is a script written by the creator of Star Trek that will feature all of the original actors from Star Trek in their original roles. Right. Is this Star Trek? Ooh. I mean, should this be considered canon? Or well, is canon only something... I mean, I know what the official rules are. Only if it appears on screen, then it's canon. And I, I understand that, and I get that. But can you get closer to being, quote-unquote, Star Trek 
when the creator writes a script. Right. And and I would say that they would have to dispute whether it's canon or not. They being who? Gene Roddenberry. Right. I suppose so. Since, again, he's the creator and he created this work. Right. It's just an interesting idea, isn't it? it yeah. It's, it's – um, you're in the – Who's on first realm here, though? It's kind of a gray area. Yes. I mean, basically, Star Trek, the property was owned by Paramount. Right. So that gives Paramount the right to say, uh, no, we don't like that. Throw it away. But again, I just philosophically, there's the creator of Star Trek creating more Star Trek. Yes. Why isn't this, quote unquote, Star Trek? Well, if a tree falls in the woods <laughs> and nobody is there to hear it. <laughs> it could be that simple. It could be. Perhaps in another universe, we got to watch the <laughs> God thing. That would be cool. And one more detail about the book involves the ending. Now, when reading the last paragraph, you have to assume that the adventure is over. Kirk and the crew have returned to Earth, and people are approaching them to congratulate them on taking care of this evil entity. Here are those last words. Quote, As the men approached, those in waiting began to applaud. Even as they pumped his hand and he embraced him warmly, Kirk's eyes were raised toward the stars. Next time, he thought. Next time. Please, let it just be the Klingons. Next week, we talk about costume designer William Ware Tice. See you then. Thanks for listening to 70s Trek, an independent fan production. Join us next week as we explore more about the production, the actors, the producers, and the influencers of Star Trek in the lost decade of the 1970s on 70s Trek.